excited to introduce our keynote speaker. This is kind of a, he's kind of a big deal. He is an esteemed figure and veteran leader in the environmental world, Carl Pope. Carl, if you could make your way up here. Thank you. Um, so Carl is the former executive director and chairman of the Sierra Club and is now the principal advisor at Inside Straight Strategies, where he studies the link between sustainability and economic development. Mr. Pope also serves as senior climate advisor to former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He and Michael Bloomberg together co-authored the New York Times bestselling book, Climate of Hope. So thank you very much for that gift to the world. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Carl Pope. Thank you. Doctor? Uh, and the outcomes were less positive, uh, but it's been wonderful to see Nevada's leadership thrive, and a lot of the people in the room, like you, Rose, are responsible for that, so uh, I'm honored to be here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, where the thoughts I'm going to share with you came from. Uh, I work closely with Mike Bloomberg. He and I wrote a book together two years ago. Uh, and as some of you may remember, he was this spring considering whether or not he was going to run for president. Uh, and in the course of preparing for a possible presidential run, uh, we looked into what we really thought was possible and realistic for the next president to accomplish. At the end of that conversation, Mike decided not to run for president. He decided to double down on his commitment to climate, and he put up a substantial sum of money to help move the agenda. And the approach I'm going to share with you now is kind of what we came up with when we looked at the landscape. Uh, and it had two very, very, or th I guess three very, very important qualities, which are things that in spite of the fact that we have very different histories, Mike and I strongly agree on. The first is, we're not gonna wait for Washington. We don't have time to wait for Washington. That doesn't mean we don't need Washington, we do. It is extremely dangerous to drive a car in reverse on a freeway at 80 miles an hour looking through the rearview mirror. That is what the President of the United States is doing with American climate policy right now. And it needs to stop. But the country, unfortunately, can't, doesn't have time to wait. Second, Mike and I believe that it's actually a good thing, not a bad thing, that most of the leadership is coming from cities, from the private sector, and from states. We think this is an issue which taps into the genius of the American political system, which is there's more than one empowered actor. There are hundreds of empowered actors, and I would say hundreds of empowered actors minus one are helping move the country forward. And that's all I'm gonna say about that one. And the third thing that we concluded was that it is easier to sell people things they want, and fortunately, climate solutions are gonna provide Americans with things they want. They're gonna provide Americans with cheaper energy, not more expensive energy. They're gonna provide us with cleaner air and healthier lungs. They're gonna provide us greater local economic autonomy and dynamism, and they're gonna protect our national security. And we believe that the reason the climate problem can be solved is because at this point, unlike what was true 10 years ago, we can say with confidence, climate solutions are good news for the other things you care about. Let me give you a few examples. And I want to start, there's been a little bit of a couple of the questions that I heard earlier were talking about the fact this is about energy and transportation. I'm going to ask that you consider collapsing those concepts. You would not have had a conversation in 1920 about lighting and electricity. They went together. And we're moving into a world in which energy and transportation are really part of the same solution. A couple data points. If you are New York City, 
and you choose to buy electric fleet vehicles for your city cars, you will save $1,600 a vehicle in maintenance costs alone, and you will cut your fuel costs by more than half. That's buying a Chevy Bolt versus a Ford Focus. Next door in California where I have the data, five times as many people work in clean energy industries as work in the fossil fuel industry, in spite of the fact that California is one of the major oil and gas producers in the United States. Its employment impact is now trivial compared to what we're already getting from clean energy. By inauguration day, a major fleet shipper like Federal Express will already be able to buy electric trucks that would be cheaper to operate than diesel trucks. Class 8, 16 wheelers, 500 mile range, equivalent weight, FedEx will have that opportunity by the time the next president takes the oath of office. How much of a supply chain we create to produce those trucks between now and then is a very important question, but it's not a question of what we can afford. Reaching over to the east, someone just did an analysis of what would happen to the cost of driving in Colorado if the state drove it 100% to electrification by 2030, and the data shows the average Colorado driver would save $500 a year driving the same miles versus continuing to drive a gasoline-powered car. By 2023, or maybe 2024, the purchase cost of an electric vehicle will be lower than the purchase cost of an equivalent internal combustion engine. And then you get all those savings on maintenance and fuel costs after that. And by 2025, Electricity produced by wind, solar, combined with energy storage and load management will be providing economies which embrace that opportunity with the cheapest electricity and the most reliable electricity in human history. So what does that say about the shape of the economy that we're headed forward to? There are some unknowns how to replace the use of fossil fuels in the manufacture of things like steel and cement is still a big challenge. It needs a lot of research. The agricultural sector, we've only begun to look into what 21st century agriculture should really look like. Probably looks quite different, but we don't know yet how to do that. So there are some very, very big, gnarly problems we don't know how to solve. And one of the things that whoever the next president is of either party should do we should dramatically increase fundamental federal research and development in these new solutions, in these sectors where we don't know what the second half of the 20th century looks like. We will not be using Bessemer blast furnaces in 2075. We will be using something different, and we need to be figuring out what it is. And that is about a third of our climate problem. About a third of our climate problem is in hard, to decarbonize sectors like aviation, shipping, cement, steel, metals, petrochemicals, where we need fundamental innovation. But the remaining two-thirds of our climate problem, we know how to solve. And we know how to solve in a timely fashion that is good for our short-term economy as well as our long-term security. And the fundamental triple play is quite simple. We push forward to decarbonize electricity, and at the same time, we electrify on-road transportation and buildings. All of the technologies we need to do that are available, scalable, and affordable, and they will get lots better between now and 2050. But right now, we can say, 
that's a pathway we need to go down. It may be that we do have small generation nuclear power that is both safe and affordable, and that will then become an additional solution. I suspect that at least in the interim, we will be using carbon capture and sequestration in our cement mills, our, our cement kills, our steel mills, and perhaps many of our natural gas power plants. But there was also a study that came out this morning from Bloomberg New Energy, which says that by 2050, renewable hydrogen at unlimited scale, effectively, will cost no more than LNG landed in Europe. And that is a complete game changer if we really have hydrogen at scale. But does this mean this is all going to automatically happen? And the answer is no, and it's not automatically going to happen for two reasons. First, there are what some people call public goods problems. Other people call it the chicken and the egg problem. Let's look at electric cars. You can't drive an electric car without a charging network. FedEx can't ship its goods. Your, your Amazon package cannot be delivered by FedEx in an electric truck if the interstate system doesn't have any electric charging capacity. But nobody can make money on electric charging capacity until there are a very large number of electric trucks out there. So somebody's got to provide the public goods. And that is the most critical role for state and federal government, is to provide the public goods which the market can't provide to identify and solve chicken and egg problems. Long term, that charging network will make a lot of money. So the federal government or the state government should be able to bond it, and the bonds should be easily saleable and we should make money on them. But the fact is, somebody's got to be the first mover. So we've got that problem. The second problem is, we do have a large segment of our economy right now that is dependent on fossil fuels. And that segment is going to shrink. And it's going to shrink with what will be shocking speed. In fact, 90% of the value of a portfolio of coal stocks you owned 10 years ago is gone. That portfolio is only worth 10% of what it was worth, if you're lucky, if you were really diversified. And we're going to see, over the next 30 years, as electrification takes away the monopoly that oil has in the transportation sector, we're going to see a drastic shrinkage in the oil industry. And as we electrify buildings, there's going to be much less demand for natural gas. So we need to deal with the problem that, as Joseph Schumpeter said many years ago, capitalism is an engine of creative destruction. But the scale and speed of that creative destruction in the 21st century in the energy sector are going to require a safety net, and not just a safety net for the poor. They're going to require a safety net for communities and regions. So we need to start thinking about this transition as a process which has enormous profits, some of which need to be devoted to helping and sustaining the people who, through no fault of their own, they kept the lights on for many, many years, and we're now going to have another way to keep the lights on and a different kind of lights, and we need to make sure that we actually act like one country and take care of each other through this transition. And I want to provide a little bit of a historic analogy, because the transition we're about to go through in which transportation, buildings, and energy become one sector with an integrated system in which at one point you're, you will be using power from the grid by driving your car, but you will have stored ice in your attic to cool your house during the peak load. And at some point when you drive the car back and plug it in, you will suddenly start feeding juice from your car back into the grid to actually freeze more ice for tomorrow. We're going to be living in that kind of a world because it's going to be driven by data. It's already happening. It's just not visible to most of us. Uh, in that kind of a world, we need to look back for some precedents, and I'm going to take a precedent. In 1920, about a century ago, 
the United States was at about the same stage in the internal combustion engine revolution as we are today in the renewable electrification revolution. 1920 was the year in which the United States hit peak horse. There were 25 million horses in the United States in 1920. 37 percent of the nation's farmland was devoted to growing food for horses, not people. There were 100,000 American families devoted to the business of making buggies and harnesses. That would be the equivalent of having about 400,000 workers in an industry today. And all of a sudden, that was all going to go away because commuters got Model Ts and farmers got four tractors. And by 1930, it was all gone, effectively. By 1930, we had only 8 million horses left. And we had the harness makers were mostly gone. The buggies were all gone. And basically, as Will Rogers famously said at the beginning of the recession, the United States was the first country that ever drove to the poorhouse. The people who left Oklahoma and Kansas because of the Dust Bowl didn't ride horses, which they would have a decade earlier. They drove. Now, how did our nation respond to this phenomenally fast transition that took place in the 1920s and the 1930s. Well, for the first part of the period, we had Republican presidents. We had one Republican president who had to sit through most of it and who, who presided over the complete collapse of the harness industry, Calvin Coolidge. Calvin didn't say much about what he was doing, unlike the president incumbent and recent presidents in general. He was a rather quiet guy. But confronted with the collapse of the harness industry, he did not try to bring back horses. And he also didn't try to nationalize the auto industry. He was a conservative Republican. But he did look ahead and say, what's the next big thing? And the next big thing was aviation. Calvin Coolidge created the commercial aviation industry by creating a guaranteed market for airmail so that commercial aviation could get going and would have a market and people could invest in building airports and navigation tools and all the things that were required. And in doing so, Calvin Coolidge locked in today the fact that the largest American manufacturing company is still Boeing. And that's still a legacy of Calvin Coolidge's vision in creating airmail. What Calvin Coolidge didn't foresee was the destructive part of the equation, which came in 1929. And after that, we had to have a Democratic president to begin to construct a safety net. But I want to point out that we think an awful lot about the parts of Franklin Roosevelt's safety net that are still operative, like Social Security. Uh, there was another part of Roosevelt's New Deal, which was mostly run by a guy named Jesse, Jesse James, who actually presided over a whole effort to help industry innovate and to provide safety nets for people during the transition. And I think that the next president will be getting some pretty strong advice from a bunch of governors, including probably your governor, about things that Washington does need to do, not only to cut emissions, that's important. But we need to cut emissions in ways that bring all of America along with us. Because if we want to get there fast, and the climate scientists say we need to get there very fast, we need to go together. Thank you very much.